Okay, thank you. So it's a pleasure for me to, to introduce the, our last uh, speaker, our last plenary session, uh, Professor Rafael Juste. I hope that you can hear as well. <coughs> okay, so uh, it's a pity that we, you cannot uh, make it uh, and you can be here, but for us, uh, it was very important that uh, Professor Juste could be uh, with us, and although is uh, online. No, I think that's, this is one of the few things that we learn, good things that we learn with the pandemic, that we can make this kind of, <clears throat> of meeting and we can share our uh, knowledge, our results, and also <clears throat> to this cause. And I hope that we can have some of the <clears throat> uh, moments uh, and to, to this cause and to make questions to, to Professor Juste. <clears throat> Professor uh, Juste uh, study in the Universidad Autónoma de, de Madrid, and then very early moved to to US, and, and he, he got the PhD. And after several uh, postdocs or training in different US universities, <clears throat> uh, in 1996, as I am right, so he's, he's professor in in the Columbia University, and also is the director of the Neurotechnology Center. And also he is a coordinator of, of a big project in, about the international. Brain Initiative, no, <clears throat> and and really he, he has received uh, many hours that, that we can spend a lot of time for that. But I want to say that he is a, a world top uh, scientist in in neurotechnology and also neuroethics. That this is really a very hot topic and also is a, is a big topic in this in this uh, <clears throat> in this meeting, no. And, <clears throat> and this is one of the reasons that we we wanted that that Professor Juste will be with us, although it is not a face-to-face -face meeting, but I am sure that we will enjoy uh, this, uh, this meeting. And of course, uh, uh, I think that uh, this will be very, very nice. Uh, I want to mention also, if there is uh, online people that we, we are uh, following us, uh, they can make questions with, with the chat. And then after the meeting, we, we can have some discussion. Uh, Professor Juste, the, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you. Jordi, Joan, and the other organizers for inviting me. I wish I could be there. And uh, uh, I think uh, I'm going to try to share my my screen. Hopefully things will work out. So, uh, I don't have to convince you how important it is to understand how the brain works. Um, for reasons that are uh, scientific, because the brain generates our, our mind, um, for reasons that are medical, because of the terrible state of the um, treatment and understanding really of mental and neurological diseases. And then for reasons that are also economic, uh, because uh, neurotechnology could offer uh, new avenues for the economy. Could you actually enable my uh, sharing? Let me continue. So. Um, so again, it's very important to understand how the brain works, and uh, we still don't know how the brain works, and it's been a hundred years or more of neuroscience, and uh, here we go. Great. Thank you. So we still don't have a general theory of, um, of uh, brain function, and, uh, and you could say, well, why is that? Uh, and the reason is because the traditional approach that's now over a hundred years of uh, uh, of understanding um, brain function has to do with the idea the unit of structure and function of the nervous system is the individual neuron. Okay, first lesson in neuroscience in every textbook. This is the first thing you learn about the brain. The brain is made out of neurons, and the neuron is the unit of structure and function. Cajal got a Nobel Prize for this, for uh, and Sheraton got a Nobel Prize for that, and they call this the neuron doctrine. Okay. So it, didn't, it was not a hypothesis, it was a doctrine, a matter of religious belief. No? And, um, and this uh, unquestionably has led to great progress in neuroscience over the last uh, 100 years. No? Uh, and neuroscientists have been used uh, using electrodes to record the activity of individual neurons one by one and correlate that with the behavior of an animal, for example, or with the mental state of a, of a person, a pathological state of a patient. And uh, although we've learned a lot about the brain in terms of the molecular and cellular um, levels, um, 
we still don't have a general theory of, of how the brain works. No? And uh, it is possible that the problem, it's a conceptual problem, that uh, maybe the, the neuron is not the unit of brain function. In a way, uh, I like to compare the brain to a TV screen. Okay, just imagine that you're, you're watching a movie in a TV screen or just like you're watching me. Uh, and if you try to understand what happens in a movie, by looking at, at a single pixel, okay, it would be completely foolish uh, because no matter for how long you look at the single pixel, you'll never understand how uh, how an image is formed in a TV. You know? And the image is really the, uh, the combination of pixels, correlations in space and time and color. You know? And this image on a screen is actually uh, what we call in science an emergent property. So this is a property of a system, in this case, a bunch of pixels, which emerges from the interactions between the units. And uh, emergent properties, by definition, are not present in the individual units because they depend on the interactions between, uh, between units. So, so the idea uh, that I wanted to run by you is that maybe the reason why neuroscience doesn't have yet a general theory of how the brain works has to do with the fact that the conceptual framework um, focusing on individual neurons, it's just not correct. And that the brain generates emergent properties uh, and that these emergent properties are the functional units of brain function. So uh, imagine that the brain is this similar to this TV screen with, uh, in this case, 86 billion pixels, okay? And it's the combination, the correlations in space and time of neuronal activity, which defines structures, these emergent states that could be the units of, of, of uh, brain function and, and pathology. So this is easier said than done, no? Uh, the reason why Cajal and Sherrington and uh, many generations since then focus on individual neurons was because their methods, their technology allowed them to do that. No? Single electrodes recorded the activity of individual neurons. Um, but in order to measure the emergent properties, what we need to do is again, look at all the pixels at one and record the activity of every neuron in the nervous system. And for that, we need a new technology. And, and this is where I would define uh, neurotechnology as the technology to uh, record the activity of neurons or to alter, to modulate the activity of neurons. So, and uh, so, our idea and our proposal for, um, from me and many other uh, people is that uh, neuroscience was held back because it didn't have the proper technology to explore the uh, emergent properties of neural circuits. So, and, uh, and with that, uh, we actually uh, wrote a proposal to the uh, Obama uh, White House, to the Office of Science and Technology Projects in 2011 and proposed the idea of uh, a large scale scientific project similar to the Human Genome Project that would generate uh, technologies. Uh, excuse me, uh, and, and Rafa, can you try to, to, if you can share again, because uh, they say that you, you should be a host too. Oh, great. Now, can now we can. Now? Great. Perfect. So, uh, so I was talking about the Brain Initiative. So uh, we proposed uh, to the Obama administration a large scale project uh, to develop neurotechnology, to systematically develop methods, tools, devices to measure the activity of every neuron in a neural circuit and to manipulate the activity of every neuron in the neural circuit. And of course, computational methods to analyze these emergent properties and extract them from this data set. No? And the idea was, uh, well, let's start with small animals, just like it happened with the Human Genome Project, and then we sharpen our tools, and this could lead to applying these tools to the human brain. So the Brain Initiative was launched in 2013, and again, President Obama, uh, in the State of the Union Address, argued that this was important for three reasons, for scientific reasons, for uh, medical reasons, and also for economic reasons. And today, uh, the Brain Initiative uh, employs uh, over 550 labs in the US and around the world. Uh, and the funding for this uh, fiscal year is about $900 million. Uh, dollars. Now, 
So this is really the um, historically the, the most important project uh, in, in, in neuroscience. And it's actually three times larger than the Human Genome Project, although of course it happened uh, 15 years later. No? So um, the brain should is developing all kinds of tools, optical, acoustical, magnetic, electrical, based on nanoscience, uh, chemical, computational. And it also stimulated the generation of uh, launching of similar projects in other parts of the world, including China, South Korea, Japan, Australia, uh, Canada, Israel, and there was also another project, the European uh, Human Brain Project launched at the same time. So it uh, turns out that all these projects are developing all kinds of different neurotechnology, again, defined as methods to record or change brain activity. And in 2017, we were able to harness all these projects together in an international project, just like it happened uh, with the Human Genome Project. And this is a picture of the signature in Canberra in Australia of the declaration of uh, an international brain initiative where our representatives of all these different projects around the world agreed to cooperate uh, so that the development of new technology becomes not just the, uh, the goal of a single country, but uh, of the entire scientific community around the world. So uh, let me give you some examples of neurotechnology uh, from the laboratory and uh, how can we measure the activity of every neuron in a neural circuit. So, uh, so one way to do this is optically. So uh, this goes back to uh, the time where I was uh, a student uh, in the Whistle Lab at Rockefeller working with Larry Katz and we found out that we could use calcium indicators. So these are molecules that change optical properties when they bind calcium to label neurons in uh, brain slices of, uh, of uh, cortical uh, uh, circuits. And, uh, and by monitoring their fluorescent, uh, we were able to indirectly monitor the action potential activity of a neuron. So this is a recording with an electrode of one neuron, a voltage as a function of time. And in the bottom, you see the simultaneous fluorescent measurement from the sum of the neuron using a calcium indicator. And you can see that every time the neuron fires an action potential, there's a little increase in the fluorescent that corresponds to the opening of voltage sensitive calcium channels that bring in calcium into the cell. So this uh, enabled us to uh, image uh, for the first time the activity of a little corner of the brain. Uh, but uh, the good news is that in this little corner of the brain, we could see the activity of every neuron. So in this movie, these neurons, uh, you can see the cell bodies in gray. And whenever they experience this calcium increase associated with action potentials, you can see them turning uh, red. No? So, uh, so this is one. Uh, one uh, method using optics to uh, to get to these emergent properties. But in order to do that in, in, uh, in real brains, not in brain slices, uh, we had to develop another method. And this is two photon microscopy. This is together with Winfried Denk, uh, when I was a postdoc at Bell Labs working with David Tank in David Tank's group. And we use these infrared uh, femtosecond lasers to excite fluorophores deep into brain tissue. So, uh, so this uh, use of uh, two photon excitation enables uh, enable people for the first time to image the activity and the structure of neurons in living tissue, in living brains. And one example of that uh, you can see here. So uh, we have a mouse uh, that is awake and behaving. Uh, his head is fixed to the microscope. He's looking at a video screen where we're showing him some uh, patterns of visual stimulation. And simultaneously with that, we're using two photon calcium imaging of the primary visual cortex through a laser that comes down from the top here. And, uh, and on the bottom left here, you have just the raw data, uh, just straight out of the microscope. So the little white dots are neurons in the primary visual cortex in the upper layers. And when they get brighter is when they fire action potentials. And this is analyzed here Again, the convention is that when the neuron uh, experiences action potential, they, it gets color red. No? So this is the activity of a group of neurons in the visual cortex of a mouse when the mouse is looking at this, this uh, visual stimulation. And if you look at this movie, you can appreciate how the neurons are turning on in groups, okay? They somehow don't like to turn on one by one, but they always are parts of these groups. This is what we call a neuronal ensemble, a group of neurons that is coactive, that's firing at the same time. And this is a 
classical example of an emergent property. This is equivalent to an image in a TV screen. Imagine that these neurons were the pixels. And when they fire together, you can see a pattern for a brief period of time, a few hundred milliseconds, and then disappears. No? Uh, and, uh, and these patterns, by definition, they're emergent. You would not be able to see them if you were recording from individual neurons with an electrode. You would never understand that when this neuron fires, one particular neuron fires is because it's part of this neuronal ensemble. So it turns out that the neuronal ensembles are widespread in cortical function. So this is an example of how we analyze the data. We first detect with the algorithm the position of every neuron in these uh, calcium imaging videos. And then uh, we compute the fluorescent intensity as a function of time for every cell. And using another algorithm, we actually cal calculate the probability that the cell fires an action potential at a particular frame. Uh, and using a, a conservative threshold for significance, we build uh, these plots, which we call a raster plot, in which every line corresponds to a neuron, okay, uh, and, uh, as, and every column as a function of time. So this is the activity of an, a video, like the one you just saw, with about 102 neurons as a function of time. And in this activity, you can see that there's little streaks, these little black dots that correspond to whenever the neuron fires action potential. And these black dots uh, are actually dominate the cortical activity. And this is what we call an ensemble, a group of neurons that are firing together at a particular time like these ones here. So the bottom uh, histogram is a collapsed version of the raster plot and essentially plots the percentage of active cells as a function of time. And using this histogram, we can detect these ensembles. So this is an example of one ensemble here in the top right. These neurons in red are participating in one ensemble. They like to fire together and they do that repeatedly. So uh, these ensembles again happen in vivo. They dominate cortical activity. Uh, but at this point, we didn't know these ensembles were functional. Okay, you could imagine that, well, maybe these neurons are firing together but this is just like an accident. They don't really do anything uh, together. So to explore the function of these neural ensembles, uh, we came up with a method which we call uh, uh, playing the piano, so to speak, on the, on the cortex in the brain, where imagine every neuron is a piano key. And uh, we first image the activity of these uh, neurons of these ensembles with uh, calcium imaging. And you can see that here, this is the one ensemble, another example, another example. And then in the bottom, after we know which uh, are the ensembles, the, the piano part comes from optically stimulating these neurons with the same uh, pattern and the same precision that we've seen them before. And then we can ask the question, uh, do they matter for the function? Do they change the behavior of the animal? And uh, in order to do that, uh, we build this microscope, uh, which is a combination of a two-fold non uh, um, excitation uh, with two lasers, one that serves to image the calcium in these ensembles and the other one uh, to stimulate these neurons. Uh, this is our piano, so to speak. And in order to stimulate them in specific spatial temporal pattern, we use a device called, called a spatial light modulator, which is essentially a, a liquid crystal that has the properties uh, that if we shine a collimated two photon uh, laser beam onto the crystal, we can use a computer uh, to control the diffraction of every one of these 100 um, million pixels that this uh, liquid crystal has. And we can build a pattern of light. Uh, this is an example of two photon patterns of light that we've built. Uh, this is the target uh, uh, sample that we want to, uh, to project into the brain. And this is sort of the two photon version of that. And this is essentially holography, digital holography works in three dimensions. So it enables us to systematically stimulate the neurons in this ensemble with single cell precision. And doing that, uh, we, uh, we tested if these ensembles were, uh, were uh, functional by training animals to respond to a visual stimulation. In this case, these vertical bars of light. And when the mouse sees these vertical bars of light, we train the, the animal to lick as is ha happening here. Okay, um, and then we show the animal horizontal bars of light and we train the animal not to lick. Okay, so the animal is not licking now to this horizontal stimulus. So this is what we call a go, no-go task. We show uh, 
one particular pattern, vertical uh, bars, the animal licks, another pattern, horizontal bars, like here, the animal doesn't lick. And simultaneously, we're using two photon calcium imaging to measure these neural ensembles, to monitor the activity of these groups of neurons in primary visual cortex of the mouse uh, in the area that is responding to this visual stimulation. So the experiment is the following. Uh, we first map these ensembles, the ensemble that correspond to the lick stimulus, uh, like these blue cells in the top, okay, which happen, this is the ghost stimulus whenever the animal licks. And then these other ensembles that correspond in this case to the horizontal bars to the no-go stimulus, so the not no lick behavior. Okay, so with that, we have mapped the ensembles responsive for licking or no licking. And then what we do is we turn off the visual stimulus and we turn on our piano, our optogenetic uh, uh, piano uh, to photon holographic uh, method. And then we stimulate selectively these neurons that were part of the uh, GO ensemble. And when we do that, what we found is these animals uh, lick. So even though we're not showing the animal any visual stimulus, we could surplant the visual stimulus by the holographic activation of the ensemble uh, that is responding to that visual stimulation. And this is an example of the data, one of these experiments. So uh, maybe just look at this bottom uh, graph here on the, on the left. So this is the activity of individual neurons, nine neurons, which correspond to this ensemble, which is the GO ensemble. This is the one that gets activated when the animal sees this GO stimulus and leaks. And uh, in the middle of um, this experiment, we're using uh, this holographic uh, optogenetic uh, piano to stimulate the neurons nine and eight, okay? Which are these two neurons here, which we detected were particularly important for this ensemble. And uh, most of the time when we stimulate these neurons, uh, so again, these blue bars correspond to the stimulation of the laser of these two neurons and the little black uh, lines and whenever neurons are active. So most of the time, nothing happens. But uh, look what happens here. We stimulate these two neurons and bingo, we get uh, the ensemble to significantly get activated. And when that happens, the animal licks, okay? Which means that we're making the animal lick when we're successfully activating this ensemble that corresponds to the ghost stimulus. And this is the performance of the behavior. So uh, licking it's, uh, goes from uh, when we, correctly recall this uh, GO ensemble, uh, we get over 70% um, of the times we can make the animal licking. So this is consistent with the hypothesis that these ensembles in primary visual cortex are functional units of perception. And we can substitute the visual stimulus, the visual perception with uh, the activation of these ensembles endogenously. No? So, uh, so again, this is consistent with the possibility that these are building functional building blocks of cortical uh, activity. You know? And this is again, an emergent property. This, this ensemble is something you would never see if you record from these neurons one by one. You need these methods, this new technology to see all this uh, activity together. So, um, so let me now switch to talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, medicine. So you can imagine, uh, everyone knows that the brain is built out of different levels of structure and function. There are molecules that there's build synapses uh, that are part of neurons, okay, or glia, uh, that are parts of neural circuits that build these um, systems, you know, the, the neural uh, central nervous system, for example, peripheral nervous system. And if you apply Murphy's law to the body, okay, anything that could go wrong will go wrong. There's always gonna be a patient out there that's going to suffer by bad luck, uh, the pro one of problems. And if you consider this multi-level um, approach, then I just say, well, there are gonna be diseases that are going to affect molecules. There are gonna be synaptic level diseases, cellular level diseases, but how about this? A circuit and systems level diseases. So these ensembles could be affected in brain pathology. And we're taking a, an initial look at several mass models of brain uh, disease and explore the role of these ensembles in them. Let me first talk about <clears throat> mouse models of schizophrenia. So this is using three different mass models of schizophrenia, pharmacological mouse model and two genetic mouse models. 
in which the mice, um, you cannot say that the mice are schizophrenic, but they have the same exact mutation that some uh, uh, patients, uh, schizophrenic patients have. No? And these mice display uh, similar um, behavioral alterations in terms of positive and negative symptoms to schizophrenic patients. No? And uh, we've done uh, <clears throat> to follow calcium imaging of these uh, mice and then control mice on the left side, you can see a movie like the one that I showed you earlier, where you can see these neurons firing together, these ensembles. And the moving on the, the movie on the right here, this is a schizophrenic mouse. And just by looking at the movie by eye, you can tell that something different, that these ensembles are not very crisp. They're not very coordinated. And you can see this in this mathematical analysis using simple PCA, that um, it's a multidimensional reduction method and every one of these traces represents one ensemble. So this is a control animal that has a couple of clear ensembles. And this is a schizophrenic or mouse model of schizophrenia mouse, where you can see that these ensembles are disorganized. So this had led to the hypothesis that we're investigating that schizophrenia could be an ensemble disease, no? that there is a physiopathology at the circuit level that affects specifically uh, neuronal ensembles, and that could lead to the positive and negative syndromes of schizophrenia. Let me show you another example of a disease. In this case, it's Alzheimer's. Again, uh, this is a mouse model of Alzheimer uh, using uh, this uh, tau, uh, tau pathy uh, model, the P301S uh, mouse. Uh, and we're doing two following calcium imaging of control uh, wild type litter mates and uh, tau mice. And again, by eye, you can see that uh, in these control mice, you can see groups of neurons that are firing together. You can analyze them in these different types of uh, cross correlogram where we're corre correlating the activity of individual neurons against the activity of all the other neurons in response to this visual stimulation, uh, just like I showed you earlier. And these uh, territories of uh, hot color of yellow corresponds to the coherent activation of an ensemble. So this uh, analysis demonstrates the presence of these ensembles that respond to different visual stimuli in these control mice. But look what happened in these Alzheimer mice. No? So uh, the stimulation is the same, but now these ensembles are again broken up. No? Um, they're larger and they're not very strong. That means that the correlation coefficients are small. So this demonstrates that uh, in Alzheimer's uh, uh, mouse models, you can see uh, pathology at the level of these neuronal ensembles as well. Uh, we've also done similar experiments in mass models of autism. In this case, we use a model uh, using an injectable small molecule that increases the proliferation of cortical neuroblasts in the ventricular zone in the mother, in pregnant mothers, and that leads to an overproduction of about 15 to 20 percent of neurons in the in the cortex. And that uh, turns out that uh, about one third of autistic patients have an increased cortical density. Uh, this is something that's not very uh, well understood, but you can phenocopy this problem in mice. And lo and behold, these mice suffer from behavioral alterations with uh, self-grooming and isolation uh, that resembles in, in, in some way uh, the deficits that you've seen in aut autistic uh, patient autism um, spectrum disorders. No? And lo and behold, in these mice that have additional neurons, we have also additional ensembles. So we see a higher number of ensembles than in normal mice. And these mice, interestingly, also have better behavioral performance in terms of visual discrimination. This is consistent with the hypothesis that uh, the pathophysiology of autism could involve also the generation of extra ensembles in the, in the cortex. And finally, let me just show you examples of, uh, of epilepsy. Again, this is uh, mass models of epilepsy. In this case, it's pharmacological model. And uh, we can image these cortical circuits using two photon calcium imaging, just like I showed you earlier, uh, during epileptic seizures. And, uh, and so these are just examples of some movies where you can see epileptic form events crossing uh, cortical circuits in vivo. Uh, in these mice. And when we analyze the progression of epilepsy through the cortex, we find indeed that it goes through these uh, ensembles, that it progressively recruits neural ensembles. So neural ensembles are recruited in these mouse models of epilepsy, suggesting that the progression of epilepsy could also recruit uh, 
these uh, emerging uh, functional units of the brain. So in terms of neurotechnology, um, like this is neurotechnology to, um, to measure the, uh, the activity of neurons. And I showed you uh, two phenomena of genetics, neurotechnology to, uh, to change or modify or alter, manipulate neural activity. And let me just show you another type of neurotechnology. This is coming from uh, uh, optochemistry. And this is work in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Roberto Chenica, the Universidad of Buenos Aires in Argentina where uh, we've used ruthenium, this uh, metal to build uh, light antennas, okay, that uh, can be coupled to neurotransmitters. And this way we can make cage compounds. So this is an example of cage GABA. So this is the uh, inhibitor neuro neurotransmitter GABA, which is linked through this nitrogen bond uh, to this uh, ruthenium core uh, that has this sort of optical uh, antenna properties. And when we shine light on this uh, cage uh, uh, compound, on this cage GABA, we call it ruthenium biperidin, ruby GABA, no? we can release GABA and activate GABA receptors opt optically. And this works with two photon or with one photon light. And this is a way to uh, activate or inactivate neurons. In this case, we've used this ruby GABA to stop epilepsy optically in a rodent model of epilepsy. In this case, again, using 4AP model, pharmacological model. Uh, and this is the electrocorticograph, uh, graphic uh, recordings of these seizures, okay, in this, in this animal. And in a controlled uh, experiment, when we shine blue light uh, to the cortex, nothing happens, of course. Uh, but if we perfuse this cage compound, Ruby GABA, okay, on the surface of the cortex, and then we shine light, we can stop these seizures for a few minutes. No? And these seizures are among the strongest seizures that you can get. They resemble some of the uh, the, uh, the most um, uh, uh, serious epileptic syndromes in, in humans. So it's here we can control epilepsy optically in a, in a mouse. And this gives hope that maybe in the future we'll be able to use neurotechnology like these optical methods that I show you to uh, control uh, seizures to control maybe other uh, brain disorders you could imagine providing uh, the person with a cage compound, which by the way, uh, many of these cage compounds cross the blood brain barrier, and then it gets delivered through the brain and does nothing until you shine light on it. And when you shine light, you can uncage the compound. It could be glutamate, it could be GABA, it could be dopamine, serotonin, or any, all kinds of, of neurotransmitters can be caged. And then you can use that to uh, perhaps prevent a seizure uh, in, a, in, a, in a patient, just like we can do this in a mouse. No? So I discuss um, this neurotechnology, uh, why this is important, why it, uh, um, this could lead to uh, exploring emerging properties of brain, of brain circuits that could be critical to understand how the brain works in terms of science and for the pathophysiology of brain diseases and could also lead to these uh, new types of therapies. No? And this is all good, but, uh, but you know, the brain is not just another organ of the body, it happens to be the organ that generates the human mind, as you know, everything that we are mentally, our thoughts, our perceptions, our, our memories, our imagination, our emotion, they all come out of the activity of these brain circuits. So we have technologies, neurotechnology that's been developed in a worldwide effort, okay, to both uh, read uh, or, or, or measure and, and activate and modulate uh, neural activity. By definition, this technology will enable to measure and modulate mental activity in humans. And this is unavoidable, uh, it's starting to happen. Um, we, what we can do in a mouse today, we can do in a human tomorrow. And uh, this led to, uh, to the possibility uh, of um, uses of this new technology that could be uh, not scientific or medical, uh, but uh, and it could have some serious societal and ethical consequences. And this is something that, the, the press has uh, uh, alerted us uh, off for now a few years. And this led to a group of us uh, um, that's in this picture, which has representatives of every one of these brain initiatives that I mentioned earlier, and people coming from the clinic, neurosurgeons, neurologists, from bioethics, from the law, neurotechnology, and also people coming from artificial intelligence uh, community uh, like uh, Google and Kernel, et cetera. And we got together in 2017 in this building at Columbia, which is the building where I'm speaking from. No? 
and uh, to study the ethical and societal consequences of neurotechnology. You know? And uh, we actually, this building is right next to this other building, the brick building, which is actually a national monument in the US. And the reason for that is that in the basement of this building, which is called Pupin Hall, is the physics department. They built the first atomic reactor in the world. And this led to the Manhattan Project, the creation of the atomic bomb. And that's why it was called Manhattan, because it started right here in the middle of Manhattan, although later they, they moved it to the desert in Los Alamos. So, um, so this exemplifies that technology is neutral. You can use it for good or for bad. You can use nuclear energy to solve the energy crisis in the world, or you can use it to make uh, weapons of mass destruction. And the same physicists that built the Manhattan Project were the first ones to argue for the regulation at the global scale of atomic energy. And through their efforts, the UN created the International Atomic Energy Commission uh, that has regulated atomic energy since the 1950s, fingers crossed, without any, any, any mistake yet. No? So, um, so we were inspired by what happened here a few generations ago to study the ethical and societal issues of neurotechnology. And we came to the conclusion that uh, this is a human rights issue, you know, that new technology has the potential of uh, intruding the essence of what makes us human. And that uh, we came at the idea of new human rights, which we call neural rights, that would protect neural activity uh, from uh, unintended uses of neural technology. You know? um, so we uh, propose five new uh, neural rights, the right to our own mental privacy, so that the content of our Neural activity is not decoded with our consent. Okay, the right to our own identity, our own self. You know, the self uh, and our identity, our consciousness is also generated by the brain. Of course, why wouldn't it be? <laughs> and the ability to use neurotechnology to modulate and alter brain activity has already led to situations where there is change in personality of people. In some patients that use deep brain stimulation, for example, for Parkinson or severe depression when uh, they get stimulated. No? And we think that the possibility of changing and altering our, our identity, it's something that should, uh, should be, uh, uh, it should, we should protect ourselves against that possibility and that it should be a basic human right. In fact, if we don't have the right to our own identity, why do we need the rest of the human rights? So, uh, we also argue that we need to protect our own agency, our own free will, the possibility of making decisions um, by our own internal processing without having it be manipulated from the outside through neurotechnology, just like we can do with, with mice, as I showed you earlier. And then we think that neurotechnology will lead to uh, cognitive and mental augmentation. It's unavoidable. Humans have always tried to augment themselves and we will, we're not going to stop now. Um, so, uh, so we think that when that happens, neurotechnology should be ushered into the population under the universal principle of justice, no? to prevent uh, the possibility of having two types of humans, humans that are augmented and humans that are not augmented. Our final uh, neural rights is the protection from bias and discrimination by the algorithms that are using neurotechnology. You know, neurotechnology and AI go hand in hand so that we have to make sure that these algorithms that we're implanted into people's brain for all kinds of reasons should be uh, uh, a clean of biases and discrimination. So this picture shows the entrance of the Museo de la Memoria in Chile, in Santiago, which is a wonderful museum devoted to human rights. And this is the entrance of the uh, uh, Geneva headquarters of, uh, of uh, the UN, um, where uh, human rights are being discussed. So our proposal is to bring this to the attention of the United Nations so that these issues are uh, discussed by international community and have to be incorporated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is written on this wall or on the existing human rights uh, treaties uh, from the UN. No? So uh, I just finished with a couple of efforts that we've done uh, in terms of promoting these neural rights in the Republic of Chile, working with the Senate of the Republic, with the House, uh, the Chamber, and also with the government. Uh, uh, we sponsor a constitutional amendment to Article 19 of the Chilean Constitution that you can read here in Spanish. And this amendment protects um, uh, um, neural activity, cerebral activity, and the information that comes from it as a basic human right. No? And there's also another bill for neural rights, which is in progress in Chile, uh, that will actually uh, uh, link this constitutional amendment to a specific set of regulations uh, 
to protect the citizen from unintended use of neurotechnology. Uh, this is the uh, official uh, uh, signature of this constitutional amendment uh, in the official diary of the Republic of Chile last year. And uh, I also should mention that we've been working with Spain with the Secretary of State of Artificial Intelligence led by Karma Artigas, uh, which is here, to incorporate neural rights in the Charter of Digital Rights of the country, which although does not have, uh, is not legally binding, it could serve as uh, guidelines for the development of future, uh, of future regulations and, and legislations in Spain. And finally, uh, we, we're working with the UN, with the Secretary General of the UN, who was re-elected uh, last year. And it's his common agenda. Uh, he has incorporated the idea that part of the agenda for the UN for the next six years is to update the human rights with respect to frontier issues. This is the words of the Secretary General and specifically mentioned uh, the right to be forgotten and neurotechnology as two of his priorities. No? So with this, I uh, finish and let me tell you that if you're interested in these uh, human rights issues of neurotechnology, we're going to have a symposium next week. Uh, it's actually on, on Wednesday. It's online. You can uh, register. It's free. Uh, and uh, you can register and participate. Uh, you can just look up uh, Neural Rights Foundation in the in the web, and you'll find our website, and I'll find our symposium, or you can just email me if you need the, the link. And uh, I wanted to also just finish on a positive note that I think the neurotechnology it's uh, it's fantastic. I'm very bullish about it you know, for reasons that I just uh, argue, you know, for scientific, uh, medical, and economic reasons, you know, and that uh, the uh, bringing neurotechnology into the world could uh, bring in a new renaissance. You no. Know? Just in comparison to the Renaissance that happened after the the, uh, the Middle Ages, now in this Renaissance, through the use of new technology, we'll finally we'll be able to do something for these um, patients that suffer from brain diseases, which affect about a third or a, more than a third of the population in the world uh, during our, our lives. Now uh, we'll be able to finally understand the scientific basis, basis of our minds, and this could lead to a new humanism because. Uh, the, the the brain generates the mind and we'll be able to understand who we are for the first time. And this could have major con uh, consequences in terms of uh, the roots of human conflict, understanding how how to prevent conflict, uh, war, for example, law, education, of course, neuro-bio-inspired technology, no? the new branch of the economy, neuro-technology, neuro and, uh, and lead to a new humanism, uh, essentially, that We'll be able to find out who we are. What it what does it mean to be to be human? What is the uh, what what is the what is our mind? Or how how do we define ourselves? And with this, I will finish, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you <clears throat> very much for your talk. It's really very impressive. I must say that I, I feel a little better because in this meeting we had uh, some talks that you can, with this kind of hats, with the electroencephalograms, you can, and recording your activities, you can modify the activities with virtual re reality, you can modify your behavior. So I expected to go to the psychiatry if, if, you, if, we, if we are changing our behavior all the time. So and I think it's very important what you are doing with these neuro rights, you know, they, because it really these neuroethics that we, we need because um, maybe with these neurotechnologies we are getting very close to, to, to do some kind of, uh, I don't know, phantoms or whatever, no? <clears throat> and, but you are optimistic because, uh, I mean, you need some laws, you know, because uh, uh, there are, your meetings are some kind of advice that, of course, they are very smart and, but you think that the, I don't know, it's like the climate change, you know? There are a lot of uh, meetings, but uh, you're, you are optimistic that then in the local level and also in the international level, that the governments could go to, to do this kind of laws? Yes, uh, actually this agenda of uh, neural rights has been uh, well received uh, by uh, uh, at the international level, at the uh, individual countries level, at the local level, and by a lot of for uh, civil society organizations, no, and academia as well. Um, so um, I think neurotechnology still hasn't hit the world. You can see it coming. It's going to happen no matter what, no, and and, and it's going to be transformative. We can tell that already. No? Uh, but it hasn't yet 
the, the devices that have been developed and been sold are still pretty primitive and the type of brain decoding or brain manipulation that you can do with non-invasive devices, I mean, just with all my respect to the developers and their hard work, but they're still, I would say, uh, not, uh, um, not comparable to the kind of uh, specific manipulation and decoding that we can do with invasive devices, either in animals, as I show you, or in the clinic with patients. But it will happen. So, um, but I'm optimistic because, uh, as I told you, there's already one country in the world, okay, where there's this is protected by the constitution. So at least we can all move to Chile <laughs> and then we wouldn't uh, worry. But there are other countries that are very interested in this now. So the UN uh, is getting involved. The UN is, uh, is the, the logical place where this discussion should happen. But, uh, and I, I told you that there's some pro uh, progress in Spain, actually in a couple of weeks, uh, we've been invited to uh, for hearings in the European Parliament in, in Brussels. No? We've been to the White House to discuss these issues with the Biden administration. We've been to the Capitol Hill to discuss it with the uh, in, with Congress. No? Um, and there's some states in the US that are interested in, in promoting a pilot bill, just like uh, Chile. Argentina is also following the Chilean uh, example and is, uh, has a bill to protect uh, uh, brain activity uh, as basic human right. And uh, we're also working with companies. We've worked very closely with IBM, for example, um, to make a pitch, a uh, joint pitch to the Biden administration that this is an issue that should be carefully studied. So I think it's still uh, we're still on time. Uh, it's not like with the climate that we're arriving a little bit late or with AI where we're super late, no? or the internet or social media where we're trying to regulate things that have already happened. In this case, the new technology hasn't yet happened in terms of the, in my my opinion, my humble opinion, in terms of the, uh, um, the its deployment in the society. So this is the perfect time to define guidelines like guardrails in the road. This is the this is what uh, we can do, and this is what we cannot do. Come to an agreement, no, and then put these uh, guidelines in place uh, as uh, new types of human rights, and then let uh, companies and laboratories develop all the technology that they want as long as it's within these guidelines. I think this would be for me a, a lesson from the past, from the atomic energy people yeah. or the AI uh, example, no, where we can do better than, than that. No, we can probably do something, get our act together as, a, as a globally before the problems uh, hit us. No? Okay, <clears throat> some questions over there. for the inspiring presentation and work. Uh, I, I would like to, to hear your thoughts about uh, the elemental building blocks for, for understanding the brain. Uh, you, you spoke about uh, ensembles versus individual neurons. So uh, l let's suppose for a second we can record simultaneously from every single neuron in the brain. How, how, how do you get then a testing if neural ensembles are, are the right thing to look or individual neurons? So uh, we're in the middle of doing these experiments in mice. We're also working in Hydra, and which is a small animal. Where in Hydra we can actually uh, do what you said. We can measure for the first time the activity of every single neuron in the nervous system of an animal. This is the first time that has happened. Actually, let me show you a, a movie because it's really uh, it's really great to uh, to see these these movies. Okay. Um, so here's an animal. This is an, an cnidarian. Okay, these are the cnidarians are the uh, animals like jellyfishes, uh, sea anemone, corals, hydrozoans, like this one yeah. here. And these cnidarians are the uh, I don't know. Can you see the movie? Yeah, yeah. yeah Great. Yes. Yeah. So these cnidarians are <laughs> the first animals in evolution in the tree of life that develop neurons. So you're looking at the first nervous systems in evolution. Uh, they have a few hundred neurons, and we've uh, label them with calcium indicators. In fact, that we get about 95% of all the neurons in this movie of the animal. And you can see how these neurons are firing. Uh, and they and you can see how they don't fire individually. They fire always in groups. <laughs> so already the Nidarians, and these guys evolved 750 million years ago, OK? So already the Nidarians have these ensembles. And these ensembles in Nidarians are correlated with behavior. No? So um, I think the, the, the test of whether ensembles are important is uh, what we, we've done in the, in the mouse. And I show you some of the data. 
uh, to prove that something is important in biology, you have to do two things. You take it out, okay? And then if you take it out, see what happens to the behavior and that proves that it's necessary for the behavior or you put it in and that proves that it's sufficient for the behavior. If you put it in and then you generate the behavior. So with ensembles in the mouse uh, visual perception, they demonstrate that ensembles are necessary and sufficient for behavior. No? Um, with individual neurons, uh, when we stimulate individual neurons, we never get these things unless these individual neurons are the ones that trip the entire ensemble. And this is a special type of neuron that I haven't discussed that we call them pattern completion neurons. And they're like little trigger points for these, these ensembles. Okay, another question over there, Sandra. Hi, yeah, fascinating talk. I actually have two questions that uh, I will try to keep them very quick. So the first one is scientific side. So I was and in your ensemble in the raster plots that you show, uh, do you know if there's a quantitative difference amongst the uh, implication of each of the neurons that it's fired in the ensemble? So meaning if they contribute equally to the whole system. Yep. And the yep. second one, uh, let, so let, let me just answer, go let, straight. Let, let me answer this, this question quickly. So uh, the answer is uh, different neurons have different weights in the ensemble. So we've done graph theory analysis um, and, um, and we find some critical neurons like nodes. These are the ones that we call pattern completion neurons because if you stimulate those, sometimes you get the entire ensemble to, to engage. No? So uh, we think that the, the way the brain is, is using ensembles is probably through the manipulation of these key nodes in the, in the ensemble. Yeah, sorry, and then the, your second question? Yeah, and the second is on the bioethical part. So in my lab, we work with organoids and yeah. in the recent, like latest years, many people is asking us directly uh, whether they should be protected ethically. So uh, I mean, I mean, I would like you to, if you could comment on that and what do you think for all the kind of synthetic you know, uh, devices yeah. or based on biological neuronal activity that can be promoted, should be, be considered yeah. into this new regulation coming up? Well, um, honestly, I, I don't know. I cannot tell you um, whether organized should be protected or not because we still don't understand uh, um, you don't have a general theory of how the brain works. <laughs> so we don't understand if organoids, the activity that you have in an organoid, it's has um, any relation to the types of uh, of uh, mental or cognitive activities that you would think would need protection. So I think it may be a little bit too early to to jump in here with organoids, no? Um, and, but I can look at the future. Imagine down the line where you build uh, um, brain-computer interfaces, uh, and this leads to the uh, cognitive and mental enhancement of people. Uh, by the way, this I think is unavoidable, okay? So just like we're enhancing our, our lives through using these little uh, gadgets in our pockets, no, uh, that in, essentially connects us to the internet, well, in, this will happen with headgear, with uh, neurotechnology, invasive or non-invasive, that will enable us to increase our, our our memory, use external algorithms for faster processing of information, enhance our perception, provide us with maybe connections to uh, robotic uh, systems, you know, av avatars, you know? so this is going to lead to, uh, this could lead to a hybrid species, you know, where humans use technology to augment ourselves, uh, not externally, but internally. Um, and this is a very serious topic. Uh, this is not something we're going to solve here <laughs> in a couple of minutes. I think this needs uh, years of discussion and we're, we're not even the right people to discuss this. We have to have in the uh, in the in the table uh, the representation of the citizens uh, from uh, a representation of different cultures no? to decide what type of human being do we want to be. Okay. And then we put that, when, once we decide what type of human being we want to be, we can put that in the human rights charter. And then that's what I was saying as guide rails. And then we say, okay, let's go in this direction. This is, this is the type of human we want to be. And I think it, mental augmentation will be good. Uh, uh, it could lead to a, a better society. You know? It could lead to, it, I can see all kinds of benefits. You know? So I would encourage um, 
the development of new technology for for this purpose but it has to be done in a way in which again it it follows universal principles of justice among others thank you another question over there yes thank you very much for your talk so i have a very complicated question and i'm okay. quite aware of it <laughs> i'll do my best <laughs> thanks so Usually what happens to me in this kind of conferences is that I'm yearning a little bit of communication between people who do neuroscience at the cellular level and people who, like me, do neuroscience with neuroimaging. So my question is whether, like, would you risk any kind of interpretation of your data to extrapolate it? to what we are seeing in neuroimaging in the sense that we are usually seeing networks working to realize any kind of task. Yeah, so um, there's still a bridge between levels. Uh, and uh, in fact, there's a lot of, as I told you, there's a hundred years of work at the single neuron level. There's maybe 30, 40 years of work at the molecular level. And there's maybe, I don't know, 10 years at most of work at the circle level. So this is like a big hole in the ladder. And then there's a lot of work already for for decades at the at the higher level, the level that you work on with uh, neural imaging, with fMRI, or and even if you go above that, at the behavioral level, psychology has a history, which is also over a hundred years you now of psychophysics, so exquisite work. You know? So we need to connect these these levels, you know? and we still have this big hole in the middle. You know? How do you connect? How does the activity of neural circuits lead to all the uh, uh, let's say mental and cognitive abilities of human. That to me is the central question of neuroscience. How do you get from neuronal activity, like I showed you, to uh, to your thoughts, not to your imagination, to your your emotions. So, um, so we're far from there, no. Um, but um, that doesn't mean that we should uh, not try to um, to ignore what goes above and and below. And we're constantly, I myself and, and my colleagues that work at the circuit level. So I consider myself a circuit neuroscientist. But we're constantly uh, looking down at what happens at the biophysical level, at the single neural level, and what's going up in the in upstairs from us. No? But I can tell you one point of an, a connection between uh, what I, you just said. Uh, the conclusion of many of us that are working at the circuit level is that we're dealing with a neural network. That this is not an electronic circuit like uh, like you find uh, with specific wire. No, no, this is a neural network. And uh, and we find a lot of evidence of that uh, when we look at these neural ensembles. No? When we uh, use new technology to decode, for example, uh, activity in primary visual cortex that responds to motor commands or to um, motor behavior. No? So we're more and more uh, certain that we're dealing with a neural network that is brain-wide. No? And this resonates very well with uh, a lot of the results from your field and your colleagues. Now that this is we're dealing with networks here, no? uh, and that uh, and that that hopefully will be the beginning of building this this bridge. No? But to build this bridge, I have to tell you that we also need technology. Now we need new technology. Imagine you can do fMRI with single cell resolution. Wouldn't that be a dream if you had a single cell resolution fMRI machine? I mean, the resolution right now for a, on a good day on a voxel could be 50,000 neurons. Well, can you get that? Uh, can you improve the spatial and temporal resolution of of, uh, of brain-wide imaging? No, and that that could help uh, get to the goals of the brain initiative. Yeah. Uh, another thought. <clears throat> uh, I have a a question, and I don't know if you agree because uh, to to try to find treatments for neurodegenerative disorders or neurological disorders. I think I have the feeling, or well, this is what we did no? in, in my lab, and to spend most of the treatments are more cell-oriented, no? And maybe we should go more to the network-oriented. Of course, then now we have all these tools that you show Sorry. here, but maybe this uh, delay that we have to find treatments for, for many of this is because maybe we should go more to, to this network-oriented treatments. You really exactly, doctor. exactly. This, this is the point I was trying to make, no, that uh, uh, as doctors, and I can still consider myself a doctor too, <laughs> we've ignored the, uh, the circuit level because we didn't know anything about it. No? So we use the tools that we had and we say, well, we can clone things and we can sequence the DNA. So let's just find molecular and cellular uh, uh, signatures of, <laughs> uh, of these brain disorders. No? But we've ignored all this level. And when we look at it just with these methods I show you today, you see all kinds of pathology at that circuit level. And one particular case is schizophrenia. 
I mean, schizophrenia, if you have to pick one brain disorder where we're really at a loss, it's schizophrenia, in spite of the <laughs> heroic efforts of our uh, psychiatry colleagues. No? Uh, the pathophysiology of the schizophrenia, it's not understood. <laughs> uh, this is a devastating disease. No? And uh, people try to go at it with a genetic approach, and they found there's over 100 genes that are involved. Like, oh my God, this is just not a good idea. So uh, in different mass models of schizophrenia, we found exactly the same problem with these ensembles. So, uh, and uh, this is uh, suggest again, the idea, and this is not our, our uh, it was not our idea. Someone else proposed this, uh, Rawls proposed this, of essentially a, an attractor uh, uh, pathophysiology for schizophrenia. The attractor is another word uh, for ensemble. Um, so, um, so this this is something that we're very interested in exploring. In fact, as soon as I finish uh, talking to you, I have to talk to Guillermo Orga, which is a, a Spanish psychiatrist who works at Colombia <clears> on <throat> schizophrenia, and we're going to be discussing exactly this. How can we test? I want to test this hypothesis of uh, ensemble pathophysiology of schizophrenia and maybe use some of our methods to play the piano to correct these deficits, uh, these behavioral deficits maybe first in mice. And if that works, maybe just jump to the to the clinic. No? So this is one exciting approach to look at something like schizophrenia from the angle of ensembles and maybe try our luck up there since it's been a uh, pretty hard going uh, from the bottom up. Okay, there are more questions over there. No. So thank you very much. And really in this meeting, what we wanted to do is to take care of all the levels that you say from the molecular to, to the circuits and, and the systems. And, and also I like this uh, new renaissance of the neuroscience. I think this is also a good point. Like we completely agree. I think that this is an excellent talk to, to finish our, our meeting. And thank you very, very much, Rafa, to share your time and, and your experience with us. Uh, of course, we'll, we'll keep in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jordi. Thanks, everyone.